Hey, and welcome back to the Better Divorce Podcast. I'm your host, Paulette Rigo. I started this podcast, oh, this is year six, five years ago, as a little bit of a, a, a prod to be able to give back to the community. All of you that are either contemplating divorce or researching divorce or trying to stay married and finding the resources and tools and experts to help you along your way. And many times the conversation comes up about pregnancy and infertility in marriage. And today I invited a wonderful expert, Abby Feeder. She's the founder of In Circle Fertility. After emerging on the other side of her own uh, all-consuming struggle with infertility and pregnancy loss, she created a platform and a business to help others, combining professional expertise, industry know-how, and an abundance of empathy and compassion. In Circle Fertility provides coaching to individuals and couples all over the world. Listen up, all over the world, regardless of where you live, she can help in wherever they are on a path to parenthood. Up to you. We can talk relationships and fertility all together. We are here for you. So let's start in, Abby. Welcome to the conversation. I'm so glad you're here. Oh, did I lose you? I'm back. I think I'm back. So sorry. Hi. Oh, you're back. I don't know what happened. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. We can edit. So yes. That's all right. So I'm so glad you're here. So Abby, let's just jump in. Yes. Um, Thank you tell for having us a me. A little bit about your story. Um, I know it's probably um, not easy to go <laughs> through. Uh, the, the journey time and time again, but just for everybody to have a bit of a background story, what happened and what made you an expert? Because I'm sure it wasn't something you woke yes. up and said, I'm going to be an expert in infertility. That's right. <laughs> um, I went through a crazy six year journey, my husband and I. We, of course, we got married, what is probably an, an average age at this point, but at the time it felt like later than most. We were already in our early 30s. We, we lived in LA. We came out here for, to be in the entertainment business. And in this business, people do get married so much later because they're pursuing success in their careers and ch having children isn't necessarily the most important thing to them. So it was on our radar and we were just like, you know what? We're very traditional. We're going to get married. We're going to have an easy time getting pregnant. This will not, you know, will never be part of our story. And of course, lo and behold, about a year and a half into marriage, we started trying. And when the first test came back negative, we were like, okay, we're on a journey now. Little did we know it would literally be six more years until we had success. And so you name it, we went through it. Um, in terms of treatment, we did IUI, IVF. We had pregnancy loss. We had an ectopic pregnancy. We had to reduce. Once we finally got pregnant, we got pregnant with too many for me to survive. And so we had to reduce to less. And ultimately, we did emerge on the other side with our five-year-old twins. They're now five years old. And um, when I did emerge, I just said, there has to be a better way to go through this. We certainly hit the lows of our marriage during this time. Um, and the, po the positive piece of that is that I feel at this point, like there's nothing we can't get through because we've hit the depths already. Um, and so I really just want to be there for other people to go through this and have a better experience than I did. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm just, you know, getting shivers thinking of that, that, you know, for six years, you were just on this roller coaster, um, month after month, after month, yes. after month, right. Yes. Of, um, you know, normally, you know, when we're teenage girls, those of us are, you know, could think back to being a teenager, you know, you would like, oh, my period. Oh, right. <laughs> you know, and that would be like, you know, when you're 12 or 14 or 16, you're, you know, it's kind of the curse, right? You know, right. That, that thing young women have to endure towards yes. motherhood, right? And you're thinking like, what is the purpose in this? Like, thank you. Totally. You know, like the curse from hell, pardon my but true. I remember being a teenager. Yeah. It was awful. And then you get married or, you know, and you of that age or, you know, we're in many, many times. It's just you make a decision to want to have a child. Yes. Right. And now, of course, we live in an age where we can control birth. You know, we've got <laughs> methods of birth control coming up the, 
the list is every day there's another one invented. So, yeah. you know, um, of course, birth control pills, IUD, condoms, blah, 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 blah. Um, so we do everything we possibly can to not get pregnant, right? Yeah. In college, right. dating, right. You know, years and years and years of, of even being married and being like, we're not ready, we're not ready, as you mentioned. And then right. all of a sudden you have this revelation like, oh, we're ready, we're ready. Right. And you look at it and that and, and in your home, in your head, you think, well, if we're ready, that means this is when it's going to happen, because right. that's what we're told. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, so when it doesn't, yeah. it's a very, very strange journey because you don't you know, you plan, you, you grow up planning what your life is going to look like and how, you know, whatever that might mean to you. For some, it means one child. For some, it means three, whatever it might be. And when it's not working out that way and it's pretty much out of your control, your whole life is turned around, really. In biology, we take for granted, meaning, yes. you know, just everything from sneezing to, you know, we just, if your body has a way of taking care of itself, right? I mean, other yeah. than us brushing our teeth and remembering to eat, um, you know, your body tells you what to do, when to do it, and you just are under this assumption that that good old fashioned menstrual cycle will take care of everything. Right. And right. I, um, I got married young, 23. We decided we didn't want to have children right away. And then at the ripe old age of 28, we kind of look at each other like, are you ready? Are you ready? And I, I'm not sure if it was me or him, but yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I went off the pill and the next month, OMG, um, regardless, I had no experience other than right. clients going through divorce. So I took it for granted until I heard how expensive and emotional this journey can be. Now, yes. thank you for sharing that because I have so much empathy for anyone who's had to endure it. I, again, I don't have any personal experience it. I'm one of the lucky ones, um, bing, bang, boom, uh, one, two, three, and they're now all adults. So now looking back at it though, I did take it for granted. And shame on me for doing that. I think our relationship had enough stress in it in a perfect situation. Right? Yeah. But yeah. And you add that additional stress. So now for couples that you work with professionally, you know, mm -hmm. they come to you, um, I'm sure in a state of upset, fear, yes. confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, you could probably make me a list of a lot, lot more words. Uh, yeah. Anger, sadness, yeah. anxiety, which of course doesn't help the whole body cycle. Um, Absolutely. Regulation, right? Because the body doesn't like it when it's feeling, oh, we're stressed. Let's give you a little cortisol and, you know, mess up the cycle. Now, I had been a dancer and was hanging around a lot of ballerinas. This was not my case, but a lot of these girls got to be very thin and their cycles stop too. Yeah. So it was all my, and then of course the eating disorder thing, can it make your cycles vanish and um, prescription medication can wreak havoc on it too. And all kinds of environmental things. Um, certainly not saying that I know what that list of environmental things are, but I do know that the stress you have in a marriage, whether it, you know, put the infertility aside can add to additional physical things that people feel, right? So if somebody comes to you and they are trying to have a baby and their marriage is, you know, on board and the partner's on board and, you know, kind of walk a person through, um, how you help them? I'm so sure. curious. Yes. So I meet everybody where they are. Like you're, like you're explaining, people come to me at all different levels of anger, frustration, despair, and crisis mode. I really say that I'm an infertility coach as opposed to a fertility coach because they're already experiencing infertility. Usually by the time they get to me, they've had potentially a loss. Definitely they've had some kind of medical treatment. Sometimes we need to do an assessment and see if they're happy with their doctor at their clinic because that's a whole nother thing where we are taught to just sort of, I mean, advocating for yourself in the medical realm is finally being talked about a little bit more, but I think some, a lot of the people who come to me are very unhappy at their doctor's office or they love their doctor, but they hate their clinic. How much of the clinic BS do they want to put up with in order to stay with their doctor? 
several times the husband and wife in a in a cis couple are um, not on the same page. One loves the doctor, feels like that doctor is really in it with us. We've already spent so much time and money. We're just going to stick it out. And maybe the wife, who's the one undergoing all the treatment and showing up every day to the doctor, doesn't love the way she's being treated when she's there. That can cause a really big rift. So we start with a lot of the basics, like what are you going on? I talk a lot about, or what is going on? I talk about the physical, the financial, and the emotional buckets. How depleted are each of those buckets? Because what we aim for is to keep all three of them as highly full as we can. But usually when the physical one is low, maybe the emotional one is high. Maybe the financial is at the bottom, but you're ready to keep going physically. So we really try to balance out those buckets. And it looks different for every client. Um, a lot of it is you lose the sense of trusting your gut when you're going through this process, especially if you and your partner are, are, are fighting about things a lot and you feel like, I mean, I can just, from my own experience, I can say, should my, is my husband thinking every day he should have married somebody that could give him children right away. Right. I mean, these are crazy pressures that we put on ourselves, but they're very real. And like you said, that adds to our stress level. The cortisol raises. It doesn't help our physical process of getting pregnant. So some people are at that point and some people are at the point of like, we did one round of treatment. We're shocked it didn't work. Help us. And they don't think they're in it for the long haul necessarily because there's nothing diagnosed or things seem to be going fine and it's just not working. And what that feels like, like you said, six years for me, and it is measured in months. So every time your cycle starts, it is a reflection of what is not happening for you. And so six years of that, 72 months of that, sometimes people come to me and they're only 12 months into that. Sometimes they come to me and they're farther and measuring that and how, how much is the crisis mode expanding by the time they come to me, much like therapy. Like I want people to go to therapy before they hit crisis mode. We all do, but usually when we finally reach out, we're in the shits of it and things are bad. And so we have to sort of level up to get our baseline, what, where are things quote unquote normal, and then start troubleshooting the treatment, the relationships. What does your bank account look like? Are there other insurance options? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So of course, it, initially it's a, I wouldn't want to call it a medical assessment, but sort of a physical assessment. of Exactly. It's very much not a medical, but I will say just from experience and from at this point working with hundreds of clients, sometimes there are signs of medical things going on that haven't been diagnosed or talked about. Mm -hmm. And I very much emphatically say I am not a medical professional. But we will make sure that either your fertility doctor or your general practitioner or an acupuncturist or somebody that I will help you find can help figure out that medical piece of it, too. We work together as a team. So first of all, is eliminating or, or um, supporting the physical and medical part of it. Yes. So that they yes. have the right professional or maybe even interviewing new professionals. That yes. definitely help them. Um, and it does need to be in your area because... I don't even know if you want to consider the additional expense of travel and how does travel affect the cycle and the propensity for um, fertility and implantation, yeah. and, you know, all that sort of thing. So, whew, so much to consider. So let's yeah. say um, we've done the assessment and we've eliminated the fact that, you know, everything's working, you know, and now it's a matter of the hormones and going through the treatments and, and that a, a little bit of an insight with that where uh, a client of mine had been divorced. They did not have children um, and she really wanted to have a baby or two and many. She wanted to be a mom yeah. and uh, she was kind of planning for the new life ahead. So she decided to go ahead um, and go through a serious round. I think it might even have been two. And man, the hormones they had to jack her up with, as she was telling yeah. me, she said, I was ex hyper and then exhausted and yes. gained a ton of weight or lost a ton of weight. It was just this emotional and physical roller coaster. Um, of course, she was freezing everything. It was, she was, didn't, yeah. to, there was no, it was just, she wanted a little like home base in case she was, you know, found. Yeah. Out. Like, yeah. like an insurance policy. Like an insurance yeah. policy. That's exactly yeah. what it is. Right. Sure. But I was like, wow, Tia, tell me more. I had no idea. So 
it was it was very eye opening for me the procedure. So yeah, if you think about that, every cycle your body's trying to produce one egg, and in the process of IVF, you're loading yourself with medication that tricks your body into thinking it needs to produce many, 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 many eggs. Mm, right. That so you take PMS basically or ovulation, which the symptoms of ovulation emotionally can mirror PMS significantly, and you judge it up by you know 250 milligrams a day for seven days you are really you are really playing with fire and in some ways it's such a miracle that we're able to do this not in some ways and always like it really is but yeah you have to know what you're going into and there are people who think um some of those external factors you were talking about will make it or break it so maybe it's stop using plastic shampoo bottles only, you know, gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, all these things. And I have people who come to me who are like, I'm going to do all this stuff and then it's going to be, and I'm like, listen, none of those is going to be the thing. But when we look at a holistic picture, the reality of some of those things is that when we talk about hormone disruptors, what we're saying is how is your experience when you're adding hormones to your body going to get worse or better? And so like, for example, I went through a huge phase where I was like, so on top, I was like, no gluten, no dairy, no sugar. And it did nothing in terms of my outcomes. They were exactly the same as when I was, you know, drinking wine and eating pizza. But the way that I felt on a daily basis from cutting those out of my life and my body while on this insane amount of hormones was a huge difference. And so you try it, you see what works. And if eating the Snickers bar and having the wine is actually going to bring you so much comfort that it becomes more worth it, then that's the thing that you do because you're already going through so much. Right. Yeah. Um, the and I think for the in this yes. in the world we live in are, we, unless we, I don't know, move to, I don't know, the top of a mountain in Wyoming and where right. acres and acres and acres and acres of nothing, um, where the nearest, um, civilization is it, that isn't practical either you know there's totally <laughs> and we and that's the thing it's like we can make ourselves crazy and the thing about infertility what i find with my clients at least i get a lot of type a women um i'm a type a woman and part of the reason i have these kinds of clients is because type a women are not great releasing control of this process so of course they're coming to me because everything that they've tried is out of their control. So what can we control, right? So we become obsessed with the things we can control, like our products and what we're eating. And so some people are like, but I did, I did the diet exactly right. And I still only got two eggs. I don't, and it's like, yeah, because this is a holistic picture. Maybe you're 35. You didn't eat that way for 35 years. So the three months isn't going to all of a sudden knock your eggs into shape. It can help. And I think all of it is good. And if it makes you feel good, you go for it. But you can only control a little bit at the, uh, of it at, the, at a time. You can't like switch everything in your life all at once. And so you figure out like, what do I need to do right now that's going to make me feel better? And then next month, what can I add in? And then next month, what can I add in? And you try to make those changes slowly. And that's a balance between surrendering. The exactly. Control, right? And accepting yes. what you can <laughs> and, and having a bit of faith in the process too. And, and from this side of it, cause I have my kids, you have your kids. It's so easy to say that, but when you're in it, right, you know, this, when you're in it, you want to like punch anyone in the face. Who's like, don't tell me to surrender. I have to do right. Like, cause I've been there. We know what that feels like too. Right. <laughs> I, it's hard. I, I didn't say it was easy, but there is that no. little tiny taste of having faith and, and, uh, even if it does Absolutely. take yeah. so now let's talk a little bit in segue into this, how infertility, and you're right, it isn't fertility, it's infertility. Mm -hmm. Fertility could be a whole nother problem with the marriage, but, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, when infertility is a part of a marriage, and it is, um, I don't know the statistics, you probably do, um, but whatever they are, I don't see them lessening. I see it happening. Right more and more and, and you know you're not alone this is a common or more common issue concern problem but how does infertility in a marriage affect the dynamics and the marriage as a whole mm, such a good question so 
Yeah, the statistics right now from the World Health Organization is one in six people will experience infertility. Mm -hmm. If you break that six into couples, that's one in three couples. That's very high, right? It's high, yeah. And it's crazy high. And what happens is... So if you're in sure. a restaurant with your spouse and there's... Exactly what I always say. Right? Yeah. You know, look to your right, look to your left. You know, one of the three of you is going to have a problem. Exactly. So, I say uh, it like that all the time. Hopefully should make you not feel like a unicorn. Like there's, right. not, you know, I get right. it. Right. Right. It, it has a major impact. So what do you see yeah. when, I'm sure you probably meet with couples too, as well as individuals. But yes. How do you see it impacting the marriage? So it's a really, I find there's a lot of things that happen in patterns. Um, the woman tries, and again, I'm talking about cis heterosexual relationship generalities here. Everything's nuanced and different. But in this case, many times the woman tries to explain to her husband, you don't understand. I envisioned my life a certain way and I am not okay reimagining what that vision looks like. And the husband often says, well, I envisioned our marriage a certain way and you continuing to pursue this treatment is not the way that I envisioned our marriage because we're fighting all the time. We don't want the same things. It becomes your priority. I want to be your priority. Mm -hmm. And the generalization, especially in secondary infertility, I find the man is kind of like, why can't we be happy with what we already have? And the woman is like, why can't you understand the life that I want for us? To which the man often replies, how, are, how come you're not happy with the life that you want, right? All mm -hmm. of these nuanced convert, like these are the generalizations, yes. Mm -hmm. And look, it's, we can try to troubleshoot it as much as we want. And there are so many couples I meet with where I'm shocked to learn they haven't had any of these conversations about how many kids they wanted. Would they pursue fertility treatment? What happens if we don't get the big family? And of course, like, why would you have that conversation when everything is, is like hunky dory and you're in the love pattern and everything's going great? But these are the hard, hard conversations we need to have in order to be able to troubleshoot them once we're in it. Because we can say for better or worse till the cows come home. But when this is the worst thing that could happen to a woman, and a lot of women do feel that way, what does it look like for your partner to be able to support you through that? And can your marriage sustain that? And for some, I see it bring them completely closer together, which I'm very grateful in my life. That's what happened with my husband. Again, after hitting the depths of hell together, then we were able to emerge. And I see some couples where it just completely tears them apart. And I understand that side of it too, because you're just not on the same path anymore. And you know what? That's okay. Oh, shoot. Did you lose me again? Yeah. I know. Frozen. Okay, oh, yeah. I'm here. So sorry. I don't know what's going on. It's like a little yeah, bit no. windy in LA and like everything just goes to shit. Okay, I can That's go right. from where yeah. I was. They can edit yeah. it. It's okay. They can edit it. So sometimes you're just not on the same path. And the reality is that's okay. The sooner you can acknowledge that, the better and more happy you're both going to be. And maybe that means, can we get on the same path? Is that even possible? And maybe that means, what path am I supposed to be on? Is it with you or isn't it with you? And I think, again, these are like the big life decisions that we don't want to sometimes face. And when we're, when we're pursuing fertility treatment, we're forced to face them. And it can come down to the core values of the couple and the yes. individual core values of each spouse. If, if the spouse A uh, really is their top five core values are, you know, family and connection and, you know, having that uh, legacy, that feeling and the vision of the, you know, the Christmas card or the, you know, <laughs> the, the picture on the board with all the children and the grandchildren and the more the merrier and the other person's really content with having one child or no children even, you know, or is a little bit more of like, you know, this is the card that 
we're dealt and the, you know, the hand that we're dealt and maybe they're a little more accepting. Um, I could see how that could really, you know, have butt heads. Right. And right. one person, I, I think it's very sad when one person just like not willing to try it at all, where you're like, right. listen, if we don't get pregnant, we don't get pregnant. Say lovey. Totally. Get over it. And the other person is like, you're not even willing to like go to a specialist and make sure that like, your sperm count is high and I have eggs. Like maybe they're, right. I don't have any, like, you know, who knows? Um, but if, if you're not even willing to go to the basic functional yeah. med medical question first and the other's like, yeah, if it doesn't happen, forget it. I could see how that immediately would put a strain on a marriage. Exactly. And then you see where, you know, maybe one party really will go, you know, year after year after year after year. And the other person's like, listen, we've exhausted our 401k. Um, we've done this five or six times. Let's adopt. Screw it. It's, right. you know what? We can retire earlier. Think of all the money we'll have. You know, like, right. they're in a different, they're right. in a different <laughs> mindset. You can see how if you're not congruent or at least compatible or flexible, it's going to put a lot of stress on the marriage. Um, yes. So we don't want this to be um, pouring gas <laughs> into the entire conversation. But if you are listening to this conversation and you personally are experiencing any of, any of this additional stress in your marriage or in your relationship, reach out to Abby. Please, Please do. do. You know, she, she is an expert that can really help you with infertility, infertility in your relationship. It is a factor that infertility will lead to some emotional, psychological, mental, and physical and financial stress in your marriage. It, you know, it isn't free and it takes a toll on the body. And of course, the emotional roller coaster is part of it for both parties. So uh, don't go it alone. Uh, exactly. Probably stop Googling at two in the morning and catastrophizing and reading yeah. every book on the world and watching 94 or more YouTube channels. Uh, <laughs> just, like reach out to an expert, uh, have, have her help you. Um, now for those people who have gone through infertility treatments and they did end up unsuccessful or for, you know, whatever reason, or successful with the first and secondary infertility where they weren't able to conceive a second child. Um, I wasn't sure what that meant at first. I was like, what is the secondary thing? Meaning yeah. you have one kid, but the second one is not coming along so swimmingly. Um, and the couple does in fact divorce, but you have some embryos frozen or you have eggs frozen, you know, or you're, what do you do? Um, have you ever had conversations with people about that? Um, yeah. A little bit. What, what is the dilemma there? So it's interesting when you are going through the IVF process and creating embryos, you actually have to sign paperwork ahead of time that answers many of these questions. And the further we get into more and more people pursuing assisted reproductive technology, the more outlier, crazy, out of the sandbox situations are happening where now those now get incorporated into the paperwork. Mm. So you have to talk about and answer things like if one of you passes away, what do you want done to the embryos? If both of you pass away, what do you want done to the embryos? Mm -hmm. If you divorce, what do you want done to the embryos? And there was a very famous case, I think it was with Sofia Vergara and her first husband, or maybe it was a boyfriend and they had created embryos and then broke up and he wanted the embryos. And she was like, no way, we're, those are my eggs. We're not together anymore. And I'm pretty sure based on the paperwork that they had signed, he won the embryos. And so you do have to have a lot of these hard conversations before treatment begins, which of course, better to have them before than once you're already in the middle of it, right? Mm -hmm. And then there are all kinds of things you can do. You can donate the embryos to science. You can donate them to a family in need. Embryo donation is an increasingly viable and wonderful option, mm -hmm. but there's a lot to consider. Like if you do have your own kid and then you decide you wanna do this great deed, by giving your embryos to someone who can't make them, well, your kid really might grow up one day and not be okay with that because they have a full sibling somewhere else. So you have to talk about how do we talk to our kid about this? How do we talk to our family about this? And I've seen every piece of the spectrum comes up. So a lot of options out there. The more technology we have access to, the more options there are, which I think is a huge miracle. It just means there's a lot more information to consider. 
Mm -hmm. And in my world, it also brings up conversations about litigation because if yes. you get on the same page and you do do, and I know you had, you know, to make those initial conversations yes. before and all, but that things might be different. Like you said, they broke up and, you know, she's right. like, I I don't, those are my eggs. You can't have them. And he's like, well, they're mine too. And you know, it's uh, before you know it now it's, it's a lawyer A and lawyer B trying to determine your future. And it can happen so quickly without you even thinking about it. I mean, I have seen it so many times where somebody was just wanted to be a single parent by choice and started dating somebody. And all of a sudden the person they're dating feels they have access to or custody rights over this person's single parent by choice child. You don't, I mean, it is, there's so much nuance out there. Yeah. So I know we've opened a bit of a can of worms here. In this yes. <laughs> but, you know, it, it is a, what I love about this, you know, the reason I keep doing this podcast is it, it's a, it really helpful information and we don't have the answers on a quick, you know, interview podcast, but at least we're opening that conversation, the door to yeah. knowing that there are people out there that can help you. You're not alone. Um, make sure that you feel supported, educated, guided, so that you can make smart, intelligent choices about your decision with your spouse to have children or to not have children. Because, you know, the days are gone of not plan, you know, yes, unexpected pregnancy happens, well, more often than we realize, right? But look at it the other side. I think that more pregnancies are planned than not with yeah. what the conversations that I have, particularly with couples where, well, we, you know, got married and we wanted to have our first child and, you know, they talked about it. So it, it is a conscious choice in your marriage about whether you want no children, whether you want a boatload of them, whether you want the only child, whether you want to adopt, who knows? And of course, in in um, same so, same sex couple marriages, now there's even more nuance too with surrogates and oh my, it gets yeah. more and more complicated. All I know is that when people come to me looking for a, a lack of um, involvement with litigation in the courts, they want to keep out of that genre and that process and that experience that also includes keeping their private life private. And there's enough public, uh, <laughs> you know, you can Google anything versus anything now, or, you know, we can, we can pretty much, our lives are open books now. And with AI, we don't even know with face recognition and robots and where we're going with all of this. Right. Uh, it's a brave new world that we're living in and uh, our information and our, our data and our DNA is also um, something that's up for grabs too. So it's, it's an important conversation. When you get married, don't, re don't forget you're entering into a legal binding contract and having children together means that until they're an adult, you really have, um, a huge responsibility to have these difficult conversations. Hopefully you'll never have to endure any of these uh, life journey and huge decisions. But if you do, uh, uh, Abby and I both know that you're going to be very grateful for having uh, the right knowledge uh, to help you. So manage it. Um, thank you for your time and your expertise. My thank pleasure. you Abby, for this and sharing your story and, and congratulations on your the birth Thank of your you. beautiful twins. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and that's another thing you have to uh, worry for is, uh, you know, not worry, but be concerned with you, Motel. You could have seven babies. Right. As we don't know. So what's two, right? Right. <laughs> um, so uh, what's the best way for people to learn more about you and follow you and contact you and work with you? Yeah, my, my website is In Circle Fertility, all one word, In Circle Fertility, all one word. Dot com And same with my Instagram. I'm very active on Instagram. You can DM me and any of those places you can see where it's like free conversation, grab some support, just click that link and it'll take you right to an opportunity to talk together. And I can just see if we're a fit, if I can help lighten the load for you. And sometimes it's not a fit and I will be always be really honest about that. Yeah, same here. Um, so yeah. you guys know who I am, Better Divorce Academy, whether you're looking for private, uh, 
family law mediation that is private, that is not litigated. Um, I, I do not mediate any other uh, situations other than uh, marriage and divorce situations, no business or any of that. You have the option of avoiding court. So it's something you should consider. People really are looking for the alternative methods in life now. And if your spouse says nope and says we're going to lawyer up, um, I'm a high conflict certified high conflict divorce coach. So with that said, you know who I am. Uh, thank you, Abby, again. And uh, until next time, make it better. Thanks again, everyone. See you next time.